Hello, this is Bruce Tim, producer. Kurt Gaeta, director in the uh, um, first two episodes. Alan Burnett, producer writer. Paul Dini, producer writer. Glenn Murakami, producer. By Derek Powers of Powers Technology. And here we are with Rebirth Part One. It's interesting watching these shows on film. It's funny, we were just talking before we started here that uh, it's kind of freaky to us that this was actually almost 10 years ago. The show was supposed to be like 50 years in the future, and it's already 10 years in the past. <laughs> uh-huh. It's freaky. But anyhow, it was long enough ago in the past that we were still shooting the shows on film. It's mm. pretty. Yeah. This is the last adventure of Bruce Wayne as Batman in this high-tech suit that he's put on. This is all Alan's idea. Well, it was. <laughs> I remember you pitched this to me. You told me uh, you had this this idea of of how to start the show with Bruce Wayne's last night out, and when you got to the part where he basically has a heart attack and then has to pull a gun to save himself, I just went, "Oh yeah, that's that's the opening. That's awesome." So, but continuity I'm, geeks can put it together that the girl he's rescuing is actually the daughter of one of his old girlfriends from. The animated series. And that guy with the gun, he looks very much like Mike McQuistion, our oh. one of our composers. <laughs> <laughs> Every time I see that, I always think, oh, Batman's beating the poop out of Mike McQuistion. <laughs> so, I mean, it's funny, when we started uh, talking about this show, Glenn and I were very much of the same mindset that we didn't want to do too much continuity-wise with Bruce Wayne, you know, to the, you know, connected directly to the old show. We wanted the show to be much more about Terry. And, I mean, you know, obviously Bruce Wayne was going to be a big part of the show, but we didn't want to do, you know, as, as we've talked about before, we didn't want to do just, you know, Joker Beyond and Two-Face Beyond and all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. So uh, I probably would have been hesitant to have started this show with, you know, Bruce Wayne, but once Alan pitched it to me, I just thought, yeah, it's an awesome scene, and I'm amazed they let us get away with it. I mean, it's pretty brutal. Life hard for guys like me. <laughs> I remember the BSMP loved this wrench. Oh, the wrench? Oh, yeah. Oh, that's right. We had to cut it down a little bit. That's oh, right. Yeah. Yes, we did. That's there right. Oh, there was one. actually a shot yeah. of it hitting his body, wasn't yeah. there? Yes, right. there was. Oh, that's right. We had to cut that shot out. Oh, my gosh. That's right. <laughs> I'd forgotten all about that. How funny. It's unusual in that this is the first half hour really doesn't Ooh. feature the, the blood on the lip. I have to point that out because we mm-hmm. don't see that very often. Sorry, no. sorry, Alan. But Carry it, on. it doesn't really feature Batman Beyond. I mean, it, uh, you never really. Oh, get this to first him. half hour. Oh, yeah. that's true. He never yeah. suits up. Yeah. That's he never right. Suits up. No, that's right. Not until the second episode. We tried to get him to suit up, but it, he just wouldn't do it. In this you know one. what? It's mm-hmm. fine. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. Was, you know, was... it, it works better for the story this way. Oh yeah. The mythology of Batman is so rich, you can actually do an episode without without that. It's all anticipation. and You're interested in how Bruce hung up the cape and retired, picking him up later. Never again. Now, you notice the music for this opening sequence is pretty traditional to what we had done on the, the Batman and Superman shows. It was pretty much a, you know an orchestral-style score, and we did that intentionally so that when we got to this... The opening title sequence, when it was all electronica, it would just be like, wow, wait a minute, this is not my dad's Batman. <laughs> so um, that was kind of a calculated move on our part. You know, we really wanted to, uh, right, out of the, right out of the gate with this show, right up, right up at the front, we wanted to say, you know, let's, let's just smash all the conventions and, you know, bust all the iconography as we, as we can. So... Uh, now, there's no computer graphics in this, you said. Well, I mean, it was all put together on the computer. I mean, it was actually put together in, in a number of ways. I mean, some of it's traditional animation, like right there, was you know actually animated, and some of it's, oh, it's a it's a hodgepodge of different techniques that. Uh, One's just a record turning, or, or a disc, isn't it? Uh, well, this characters? Batman Beyond shot coming up right there. This that's one. a little. That's a little action figure that I cobbled together on a lazy Susan, which I shot with my camcorder <laughs> in my kitchen. Same with the Bruce and, Wayne uh, head, right? Uh, uh, yeah, the, the Bruce Wayne head, which everybody thinks is CGI, is actually a, a maquette that was sculpted by uh, Glenn Wong, one of our character designers. And again, I stuck him on a Lazy Susan in my kitchen and <laughs> twirled him around and did, shot him with my camcorder. And then Darwin Cook fed it into the computer and made it all pretty. And it's interesting. So, so now here we are in the future. Now, remember, I really had a big problem with this idea. This is Glenn's idea of having an elevator going up the side of the building. I just couldn't wrap my head around it. Everyone loves a winner. We talked about the city having like Terry coming from like a lower part of the city and he has to like ride the elevator to go to the to school in Mm -hmm. like midtown or whatever. Mm -hmm. So it was all about like 
kind of economic classes and stuff like that. Sure. I think the the original script talked about just a train. Mm -hmm. And I said, no, he should come from the bottom and go to the top. So I know, like I said, at first I just, I, I guess I logic it out too much. I thought it was just kind of a silly idea to have a subway train going up the side of a building, but it sure works and you don't even think about it. It's just, it's just, it's a neat visual. And it, like you said, thematically it works, it works great. Yes, I did. <clears throat> I think originally we talked about the stories being more about class. Sure. All, yeah. all the all the villains were going to be rich, and we took away Bruce Wayne's fortune and everything, right? No, no. he's no. still rich. Yeah. I thought he kind of lost it all. Well, he lost then, the company, but right. he didn't lose his money. No, he's still richer than you know. Oh, big man! There are a lot of nice little. Um, subtle touches in these, like the newscasters that were on the TV, those aren't supposed to be real people. Those were supposed to be computerized, just very generic looking mm -hmm. people. Happy Virtual. Folk. That yeah. took a long time to come up with yeah. the look. A, a simple way of making things look like they were computer generated because well, we still we had to make... do everything 2D. Well, sure. Well, not only that, but if we'd actually had you know the ability to do a CGI newscaster, it still would, it wouldn't have blended Matched. with the rest of the uh, the animation. It still wouldn't look like CGI. It would look something really weird so yeah we came up with a real weird stylized graphic to indicate that she wasn't completely real another interesting thing if you'll notice most of the characters in the background like in crowd scenes if they don't have a speaking part chances are they're colored basically purple and blue that was a uh, we experimented a lot with the color on this show at least glenn did and that was an idea that he came up with that to really put our visual focus on the characters that we want to focus on we figured all the background characters we would color them pretty much monochromatically so that, i mean they have flesh color but their clothes would either be you know pale blue or pale violet or something like that they would kind of blend into the background mm -hmm. so it was a really interesting idea and it works really well and it's funny their flesh tones look really rich and robust but i remember on the on the palette it's actually almost like a grayish tan Kind of. It's yeah. a it's a really dulled down flesh color, but when it gets color corrected, it actually looks you know normal. But when we actually saw the cells, it looked like wow, they look like zombies or something. We were still working on Superman and Batman and Batman Beyond oh, yeah. all at the same time, so mm -hmm. each show had a different color scheme. Sure. Harry, you look slagged. Never mind that. Here. The um slight Victorian cut of their clothes was an idea we pinched from Howard Chaikin. You remember? It was from his uh, Star's My Destination graphic novel. We actually had Mignola do some development oh, right. real, some real early yeah. on, and he, he made everything like kind of Victorian. Mm -hmm. That's right. I forgot about Mike working on this. He had like kind of butler robots and mm -hmm. things like that. Yeah, his was real. It was actually all, it was even earlier than Victorian. I mean, yeah. it looked like you know, it looked like mid-18th century stuff or mid-19th century stuff. It was like really a lot of lace and stuff, but uh, um, that's right. I had forgotten that. Mr. Fix, I think that was a uh, James Tucker design, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I see they're still using discs in the future. Mm -hmm. And giant cell phones. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that amused me when I watched one of these just recently. It's like, yeah, the cell phones are huge. Who knew that cell phones would get so tiny so quick? <laughs> But uh, well, that was one of the things when we, uh, you know, when we talked about, you know, making the show futuristic but not too, you know, that's tricky because we wanted to, you know, make the show look different than the present day, but we didn't want it to look like Flash Gordon, so we limited the number of flying cars, for instance, and um, the technology is not quite Jetson age technology. It's pretty much recognizable, but I don't know. I, I think we did a pretty good job of making it look slightly futuristic, but not, you know, so futuristic that you can't relate to it. I tried to make all the buildings look like like lathes or drill presses mm -hmm. or things like that. They were still like really geometric, basic shapes. Mm -hmm. I know it was really hard to come up with a look for the city because you know, you know, again, what do you do to make a futuristic city that doesn't look like something that's been done a zillion times before? And we had and to do it on a TV show budget. We had to do it on a TV show budget and with no. You know, development time, like you said, we were working on uh, Superman and Batman at the same time. We basically hit the ground running with the show. We didn't have any development period at all. And uh, so we were just making the stuff up as we went. And, you know, for all that, I think it's a really great show. Um, but, yeah, it was tough coming up with a, a design concept for the city that wasn't, um, you know, overused or cliche. A lot of, a lot of rectangles. A lot, a lot of rectangles. Of stuck on panels. You know, it's, it's not that unique a future. You know, it's okay. I mean, it's, it, it's, it's, it does the job. 
I, I like the split level stuff. I like all the different uh, elevated roadways and stuff. That's kind of neat. And this is cool. That this um, there's a wide shot coming up here right there. That's neat. Mm -hmm. Mostly That's because a, the perspective is just messed up. <laughs> but it's, it's like nice. really, it's really catty. It's really uh, cockeyed. But um, it's a nice contrast to the old Gotham City, which was, you know, a pretty grimy, uh, uh, dirty place. And this is. Uh, in the future, it's it's very clean, and that was uh, directly like what we wanted to do is like show that the crime has moved off the streets and into the corporate boardroom. So mm -hmm. the city itself is is a lot nicer than old Gotham City, but uh, the upper echelons are more ruled by criminals in the streets. With these guys being a notable exception, I guess. James did most of those guys. Like designed them, yeah. Yeah. Jokers. Smiling. Knock it I like the idea that it was. We made this up as we went along, because there was no Bible on this show. We just started with the uh, first story and went on from there. Oh man. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's what I remember the most too. That just getting started on it, I still had some Supermans or Batmans to finish, and in a way, it was the assignment to direct this and. Uh, Basically, we had a script and a couple drawings, and, and somehow the clock was ticking. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. This particular music cue right here is adapted from a cue that uh, Lolita had done as a, as a sample for us. Um, when uh, we, we first started talking about doing this show with the, the composers, I didn't think I was going to be able to use Shirley and Mike and, and Lolita because I, I had no idea they could do this kind of music. So uh, they actually put together a sample CD of uh, sample tracks, and one of the tracks that was on the CD was this one that uh, Lolita had done. And um, obviously they got the job. And uh, also on that same CD was uh, uh, an earlier prototype version of what became the main title by Chris Carter. This is a nice sequence. What was this, Phil Norwood? Uh, yeah, actually. I remember having sending it back to you for kind of revisions. Kind of a second pass, yeah. I was going to say, it was it was fine probably the first time we saw it, but I thought, no, nah, you know what? It needs to be a little bit more spectacular. It just needs to be revved up a little bit. So uh, I remember you putting in the um, him leaping off of the uh, right. the over, overpass on the second pass. So here comes the big Akira sequence. He's even riding a red motorcycle. We should point out that's Bruce Tim doing the voice of the lead Joker's character. Oh, yes, character. let's do that. Let's point that out for everybody. <laughs> I did it under duress. What had happened was uh, the original actor, I don't even remember his name, who played the Joker, the lead Joker, we just weren't very happy with him for some reason. And um, I, I was at the recording saying, oh, he should sound like this. And Alan was the one who said, oh, you should do it. And so, reluctantly, I did it. And, and then, of course, Alan and the, the writers kept writing the same character into every episode so that I had to keep doing the stupid part. Like, that was not in my intention. We all do voices in these shows, and we're always doing, like, grunts and oofs and uggs and everything. We're the Jokers! Sure you are. a neat scene. I like seeing old Bruce go to town. Yeah, yeah he's how old did we decide he was? We never I said. say he's 80. I think yeah. so, too. Yeah, I, yeah. I know the, the, right. the network never wanted to say how old he was, and, you know, they didn't want him to be old and decrepit, but, uh, and he's still pretty, pretty sharp for his age. Good-looking guy. We danced around it in his, the episode where he has a birthday. I think I actually said how old he was, like like 78 or 80 or something, and then we had to take it out because it's like, he's just old, okay? <laughs> just don't give him an age. Yeah. Now, as far as I'm concerned, Batman Beyond takes place 50 years from now, whenever now is. Mm -hmm. That means Bruce is about 80. Do we mention mm -hmm. it was 1997 when, it was, when we made this? Uh, no. That's when it was. That's when it was. We mm -hmm. made the show in 1997, this particular episode. Amazing. Stately Wayne Manor. Mm -hmm. And the dog. Mm -hmm. I yep. love the dog. Yeah. Okay. Whose idea was it to give him the dog? Mine. Was it yours? Yeah, I really uh -huh. wanted the dog in there. I just thought, you know, Alfred's gone. He's not talking to Robin anymore, so he needs someone around to or else go crazy. So. Here you go. That's cool. Those were right where you said. I remember in the original draft, he was a German Shepherd, and I said, nah, he's no German Shepherd. 
he's got to be a big, ugly hound of the Baskervilles dog. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I think old, later on we said he's a Rottweiler, uh, Great, Great Dane, Dane mix. Great Dane yeah. Mix, yeah. yeah. And he's Ace, I mean, from the ace. old comic books. That's yeah. why he started Ace the Bat Hound. Yeah. yeah. I hope you feel better, Mr. <laughs> old Bruce Wayne, what a concept. Mean dog again. Oh, yeah, and I should say that the uh, the dog is played by Rob Hargreaves' dog. <laughs> Rob, Har <laughs> Rob Hargreaves is our sound yeah. designer. And uh, he actually got his dog to uh, bark on on record to play Ace. So he basically tortured his dog. <laughs> no, he didn't torture him, obviously not. But uh, you know, he's you know he basically had to like you know, kind of roughhouse with his dog to get him get his dog all excited and mm. and uh, give him a bunch of good barks. So mm. no animals were hurt in the making of this episode. I must point that right. out. Except Frank Welker, who didn't get to do a dog bark in this episode. Right. So there he is. He mm -hmm. discovered it. Looks amazingly good. No, it really does. <laughs> I mean, it's basically just our old stock, but it is repainted. And also, um, there's a, a unique color scheme inside the Bat Cave. I don't know if that's obvious to everybody who's watching the show but yeah whenever they're in the bat cave again we go to that kind of monochromatic color scheme their flesh tones don't really change but their clothes do everything's all in purples and blues their flesh tones were gray oh they actually were gray yeah they were gray it's funny because when it's color corrected it just, just looks like flesh i think you told me later on that they they color corrected it and that's probably what changed mm -hmm. all of it yeah Yeah, it's like we had to design this whole flipping world. It's like all the vehicles we had. We had like long arguments about what vehicles would look like in the future, and boy, it was a nice queue. I like this. Oh my god! I remember we wanted all of that red, and no, we couldn't I think you're make it red. You sure? I thought I, I think so. you're misremembering because that. You're 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 misremembering Return of the Joker. In Return of the Joker, when this we pulled the same gag. You know, there's 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 ha 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 graffiti in Wayne Manor, and yeah. we actually had painted it red. And when we had to go back and re-edit that mm -hmm. that that movie, oh. we digitally went in and, and made it purple. Right. So because it's blood, is that? Yeah, because it looked like blood. Yeah. No, this is I think was always intended to be uh, like fluorescent orange and green. Okay. Now here's an example of a place where we dropped a music cue. I was just listening to the score today in my car for another reason, mm -hmm. and uh, I heard this kind of this this maudlin synthesizer music that was supposed to be playing on the newscast during the uh the, the funeral notice and it was just it was too much so we said ah sorry i have to drop that so it's better without music ready for bed okay okay there's a little matt identical to his older brother <laughs> that's a cool color scheme mm -hmm. that friend of yours oh, look at all that dirt on his face so. oh gosh wow it's acne isn't it? <laughs> that's what it looks like <laughs> I, I love that color scheme, that. though. That's neat. It's real chirello y. <laughs> That's our EC color palette. Yep. What? They were jokers. He wouldn't have opened the door. He would have looked first. How'd they trace me back to him? Honey, we don't know if it's the same gang. You've got to stop. I should have been there. I could have helped him. A heck of a cast, too, you know what? Yeah. Boy. Michael Gross and Terry Garr and, of course, Will and Kevin. Yep. Awesome. And that brilliant guy playing the Joker leader. Wow. <laughs> yeah. That's that's Emmy material right there. The things I said. I'm such a jerk. When the network want us to make this show, mm -hmm. I think they always thought in their minds that it would be a lighter show. Mm -hmm. than the old oh, absolutely. Batman. Yeah. That was the whole purpose for doing this show was to make it more kid friendly. And uh, we could never really bring it down to that. It's just never you know, played it's, that way. It's interesting. There's something about this show that I don't know what it is, but there's probably because of the rock music and the intense action and stuff and kind of Terry's attitude. This show seems more adult even than some of the Batman shows that we had done. Yeah, there's, a, there's, yeah. a, there's a nasty, wicked edge to this series. It's You're weird. Because right. I remember when we were you know, first developing the show, at least in the writing phase, the network was saying things like, oh, could... Um, 
could the little brother be part of the adventure? Could he be in on the secret? <laughs> Do you think he could have like a secret exit through a closet, through a dumpster, and the motorcycle would be there? And they really did want it a kid yeah. in the Batman suit, you know, a young, yeah. you know, like tween age kid. And then it just defeats the purpose of Batman. We really. did that though. Hmm? We did the, what? The entrance or what? The exit out of the apartment, I thought. Oh. Through the dumpster. Uh, no, I don't think we ever did. Did we? I thought I we did. Remember. I don't remember. But oh, that's right. We were going to have like a separate bat cave. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. But we All never right. did. Mm. It was yeah. just too much work. Go! Yeah, initially. Well, the, the weird thing was is that, you know, when we talked to uh, Jamie Kellner, who was the head of the WB at the time, one of the, the things he kept bringing up in our conversation about Batman Beyond was Buffy, because Buffy was like the big breakout right. hit on, mm -hmm. um, on the WB at the time. And he kept saying, yeah, that'd be more kid-friendly to make it more like Buffy. And the, the thing I couldn't wrap my head around was that kids didn't watch Buffy. That was definitely a show for so teenagers and older. Yeah. So I didn't, I didn't, I could never see how making it more like Buffy would, you know, increase the kid audience. So, you know, whatever. But um, the weird thing was I never really watched Buffy back then, but a uh, big fan of it now. But back then, I think I'd seen like one or two episodes, so I had no idea how to really to make it like Buffy, which is probably just a good thing. It's more unique this way. Well, that's it for this one. Goodbye. Goodbye. See you later. Bye. So long.